Okay, everybody, now's the time. Come on in, welcome, welcome. Good to see you. All right. Yeah, it is good to be here. It's been a little bit of, bit of time off, but we're getting started again. So we're in Daniel 10 is where we're going to be starting, if you'd like to turn there, the book of Daniel, chapter 10. And let's go ahead and, uh, let's go ahead and commit our time to the Lord, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, thank you that we can gather here tonight. Thank you for um, these Wednesday night services, the prayer meeting beforehand, and now time to be in your word. And I pray, Lord, that we would have open minds and receptive hearts. And uh, we thank you for this time that we've been able to go through the book of Daniel and how it um, is so intriguing because of the prophecy that's in it. And not only that, but the example of Daniel himself and his commitment, his surrendered life to you. And uh, I just pray that as we go through, both of those things would, would speak to our hearts, his example for us, and also the reality of the times that we live in as we look at, um, as we look at our landscape and, and think of the prophecies that have been spoken in your word. And Father, we do lift up our country to you, and um, we pray, God, for your mercy upon our land. But we pray, I think most importantly, for your perfect will to be done and that you would be honored and glorified, O oh God. And I know that you are, you are righteous in your judgment for we, I know, need it, uh, deserve it as a nation. But we would pray for your mercy, O oh God, and pray that your, that your truth would come forth from our lives in, a, in this nation and that we would see lives changed in the days that we live in and hearts turned to you, that, that many would come to know you in these days, O oh God. Thank you for this time we have. Thank you for everybody who's uh, come out and the opportunity to spend this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, let's do a little bit of an overview as we uh, jump back into the book of Daniel here. Um, the first six chapters are largely uh, a historical setting, a historical narrative, if you will. We see Daniel taken as a captive to Babylon uh, as a young man, and then, of course, the things that took place in his life in the first six chapters. And then the last six chapters are uh, prophetic, uh, largely in nature, visions and dreams that, that he has. And so in Daniel 1, he's taken as uh, a, a young man, uh, some think a, a teenager, uh, from Jerusalem to Babylon. And in chapter 1, we see that he purposes in his heart that he's going to live uprightly for the Lord. And that's the, the characteristic that we see throughout his life as he stands strong for the Lord. And then as you move into chapter 2, there's an interesting parallel that happens with the chapters. Uh, chapter 2 is the dream that Nebuchadnezzar has. And his dream is of a metallic image that speaks of the kingdoms of the world. And it culminates in the second coming of Jesus Christ and the setting up of his kingdom. In chapter 7, Daniel also has a dream, visions upon his bed, and he has a, a very similar dream, except this time it's four beasts, and those represent the kingdoms of the world, and it culminates again with the Son of Man coming to the Ancient of Days and receiving an everlasting kingdom. Well, then when you move on from there in chapter 3 and also in chapter 6, there are chapters of persecution where you have the three Hebrew children thrown into the burning fiery furnace and Daniel thrown into the lion's den, and both of them are, are supernaturally preserved through that persecution. And then in chapters 4 and 5, you have the humiliation of a couple of kings. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream of a tree that's cut down, and that, that's depicting him being cut down because of his pride. And then, of course, in chapter 5, King Belshazzar and the writing on the wall that his days are numbered. It's an interesting parallel, isn't it, when you take a look at it like that, as those chapters clearly... Uh, parallel each other. When you get into chapter 8, and we're in the vision section here, we've, we've got the vision of the ram and the goat, and that's speaking about the kingdom of Medo-Persia and also the kingdom of Greece. And it goes beyond Greece to Greece being split up among Alexander the Great's four generals and a particular king coming into power that we're going to be talking about tonight too, Antiochus IV, Antiochus Epiphanes, that persecutes the people of God, the Jewish people around 170, 165 
BC and desecrates the temple. And then of course, Judas Maccabeus and brothers rise up and they're able to, to cleanse the temple and the, the Feast of Hanukkah that's celebrated to this day is based upon what takes place then. But in chapter eight, it, it, it's not just Antiochus, but it's a, a type of the Antichrist, one who's going to come and, and bring tremendous persecution uh, again against the people of God. So Daniel chapter eight. In Daniel chapter nine, we have the prophecy of the 70 weeks, and this speaks of the first and the second coming of Jesus. And where we've come today is we've come to chapter 10, and the last three chapters, chapters 10 through 12, are, are really one unit. It's not that chapter 10 is a vision and then chapter 11 is another prophecy. They, they all three go together. Chapter 10 is like the prologue. It's the setting up of the message. The message is going to come in chapter 11, and then the wrap-up will come in chapter 12, kind of like an epilogue to it and a wrap-up of the book. But it's a similar message uh, as to what was seen in chapter 8 in that in chapters 10 through 12, it's a message to Daniel on what's going to happen to his people in the future. It would be the Medo-Persians and then the Greeks and then again uh, after Alexander the Great, that empire being split up against four of his, among four of his generals. And there's specific prophecy in chapter 11 about the battles that would take place between two of those generals and the king of the north and the king of the south over the years. So you have the Seleucids and the Ptolemies, Syria and Egypt that are battling it out. And it's, again, Antiochus Epiphanes, the Seleucid king, that comes to the Holy Land and desecrates the temple. And that's when Judas Maccabeus rises up and is able to cleanse the temple. The Feast of Annika comes out of that. In chapter 11, it speaks to that end, but then it telescopes clearly beyond that time frame to the time of the end where the anti-type of Antiochus, who is the type of the Antichrist, when the Antichrist comes and he persecutes the people of God, and it continues on to the second coming and really on into the millennial reign of Christ as we see that at the end of chapter 11, moving on in to chapter 12. So it's um, a fascinating piece of scripture that we're going to be going through, yet we're only going to set it up here today as we look at chapter 10. But again, chapter 10 is fascinating because this is Daniel's encounter with the glorious man, the messenger that comes to give him this message concerning his people in the last days. So chapter 10, beginning from verse 1, we've got the time stamp on it. It says, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. The message was true, but the appointed time was long. And he understood the message and had understanding of the vision. The third year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, Cyrus was the leader of the Medo-Persian Empire. So this is three years after the Medes and the Persians have taken the kingdom of Babylon. Now, when Cyrus became king, he allowed um, the Jewish people to return to their national homeland. So under the leadership of Zerubbabel, about just under 50,000 people went back to Jerusalem and began rebuilding Solomon's temple. And they were able to lay the foundation, they were able to build an altar, but then persecution hit from the enemies of Israel in the land, and so the work was shut down, and they wouldn't complete it for 20 years. So they've already gone back, this is the third year of Cyrus. And it says here that the message was true in the middle of verse 1, but the appointed time was long. Now, some translations say it was of great conflict or it concerned a great war as far as the appointed time was long. John Walvoord in his commentary says, the implication is that the period in view of this message is a long and strenuous one involving great conflict and trouble for the people of God. And as I mentioned, it's going to talk about this Seleucid king that's going to come and persecute the people of God, and it's going to telescope beyond that to 
the Jewish people of the last days. The New Living Translation translates that part of verse 1. He understood that the vision concerned events certain to happen in the future, times of war and great hardship. Tremendous hardship. Um, Antiochus, again, this is just a foreshadowing of the tremendous trouble that's going to come to the people of God in the last days. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, just jumping ahead a little bit, it says, at that time, referring to the time of the end, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time, and at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. An unprecedented time of trouble, what he's talking about. And that's really profound when you think about it. Because if you look back in history from Daniel's point and, and, and saying that everything that's happened before this is, is nothing compared to what's going to take place in the future, then you're even, I just thought about this when I was looking at this this week, you're even going back to the flood of Noah's day. And you're saying that, you know what? That's not even going to compare to what's going to take place in the last time. It was Jesus that referenced it as great tribulation in Matthew 24, 21, where he said, for then there will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. So it's an unprecedented time of chaos and trouble. There's never been any time like it, and there never will be any time like it in the future, referring to this time of tribulation that's going to come in the last days. Now, there are some people that want to look at the great tribulation as having been fulfilled in 70 AD when the Romans came against the Jews and destroyed Jerusalem. Now, granted, that was a really terrible time. The first uh, century historian Josephus tells us that there were 1.1 million Jews that died in that siege. That's really, really bad. But if you're to say that this is the fulfillment of this, then you've got to look at the Holocaust where there were 6 million Jews that died and said that that doesn't seem like it's worse than the Holocaust. In fact, when you look in Zechariah chapter 13, it says that roughly two-thirds of all living Jews will die during the Great Tribulation. And there's almost 18 million Jews alive today, so two-thirds of that would be 12 million Jews, which is even worse than the Holocaust, which is worse than the Jews, 1.1 million that died in 70 AD. So I think personally, clearly, that this is referring to a time that is yet future. And so it's going to be an extremely difficult time, a very hard time. And so the appointed time was long and it would be a time of great trial. Now, in verse 2, it says, In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant food, no meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Mourning for three weeks not eating the good stuff for three weeks, not anointing himself like in the, in the desert climate with the oils for three weeks. It sounds like a time of prayer and fasting, doesn't it? And I, I kind of think about this and think about the time window again. This is the third year of Cyrus. So the Jews under Zerubbabel have already returned. They've already begun to build the temple, but the work's been shut down. And maybe, maybe that's part of the reason for why there's the conflict why Daniel's mourning, why Daniel's praying, because he cares so much about his people. And he knows that this work is shut down, and so maybe this is a time where he's fasting and he's praying for his people. In verse 4, it says, Now on the 24th day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with gold of Uphaz, his body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like torches of fire, his arms and feet like burnished bronze in color, and the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great terror fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore, I was left alone when I saw this great vision. 
and no strength remained in me, for my vigor was turned to frailty in me, and I retained no strength. Yet I heard the sound of his words, and while I heard the sound of his words, I was in a deep sleep on my face with my face to the ground. Now, who do you think this is? You think it's Jesus, and that's a good guess. It really is, because there is a description of Jesus in Revelation chapter 1 that looks very similar to this. Now, in Revelation chapter 1, this is where John is on the island of Patmos, and he turns around, and this is what he sees. He says he sees one like the Son of Man, clothed with the garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band, His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. It does sound familiar, doesn't it? I mean, they do seem familiar as you compare the two. In Daniel chapter 10, the glorious man is dressed in linen. Jesus in Revelation 1, he has a garment to the feet. In Daniel 10, the man has a belt of pure gold. Jesus, in Revelation 1, has a golden band around his chest. In Daniel 10, he has a face, an appearance of lightning. And in Revelation 1, countenance was like the sun. In Daniel 10, his eyes are like flaming torches. And so Jesus, in Revelation 1, has eyes like flames of fire. In Daniel 10, arms and feet like burnished bronze. Revelation 1, Jesus' feet like fine refined brass. Daniel 10, the sound of words like a tumult, and in Revelation 1, Jesus' voice was as the sound of many waters. And so it's, it's so similar, uh, the two of these together. But the problem with that, and that's what it seems like, but the problem with that is that this glorious man is going to say that he had trouble getting to Daniel. He was detained by an evil spirit from Persia And he couldn't get away until Michael, the archangel, came and helped him. And that's what kind of kills it as far as thinking that it's Jesus, because that doesn't sound like Jesus. Jesus wouldn't need any help from Michael, the archangel, because Jesus is Jesus. So what this is referring to here is an angelic being, an angel. And again, very similar to the glorified Christ in Revelation chapter 1. Very similar. But because of that... We, we see that it's a, an actual angel, and you'll see that developing. Now, what do angels look like? Well, in Revelation chapter 10, John said, I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. First of all, this is just amazing to think about, isn't it? I mean, the, the presence of an angelic being where the face is like lightning or like the sun shining in its strength, just just overwhelming majesty. In Revelation chapter 15, verse 6, it says, And out of the temple came the seven angels, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen and having their chest girded with golden bands. And so that's similar to the glorious man in Daniel chapter 10. And then at the empty tomb in Matthew chapter 28, verses 2 and 3, It says, and behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. So when you put these together, the glorious man of Daniel 10 and the angels that we just read about in Daniel 10, he's dressed in linen. The angels we read about clothed in linen, white as snow. In Daniel 10, the glorious man has a belt of pure gold. The angels we read about had chests girded with golden bands. In Daniel 10, the face, the appearance like lightning. The angels, the face like the sun, countenance like lightning. And then finally in Daniel 10, the arms and the feet are like burnished bronze. And the angels we read about were like feet, like pillars of fire. And so uh, being an angel is what is the popular belief. In fact, John Walvoord says, uh, in favor of this messenger being an angel is the improbability of Christ being hindered by a prince demon of Persia and needing the help of the angel Michael. And so how did Daniel respond when he came into the presence of the heavenly here? He was overwhelmed, wasn't he? 
uh, not as overwhelmed as the guys that were with him. I mean, they just beat feet and got out of there. But Daniel, he's just overwhelmed by the presence of this angelic messenger, and he falls to the ground. He has no strength. Uh, as it said in verse 7, he alone saw the vision. The men fled. We see different um, encounters that Daniel has with the heavenly. In Daniel chapter 7, where it was the vision of the four beasts speaking of the kingdoms to come. And, and remember in Daniel 7, in that prophecy, it was clear that the people of God, Daniel's people, would be persecuted heavily. And I think this is part of what, what overwhelms Daniel, is not just the, the brilliance of the angelic messenger or the vision, but the fact of what the message is, is that his people are going to be persecuted so bad. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 15, it says, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. In Daniel 8, 17, where it was the vision of Medo-Persia and Greece, and of course, Antiochus coming forth from that, he said, I was afraid and fell on my face. Also in Daniel 8, I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. So you see the experience that Daniel has with this. He's overwhelmed by it. It's funny because we love prophecy, don't we? And we come to the book of Daniel, and it's like, yeah, this is really intriguing. We love prophecy and, and all of that. But for Daniel, it was overwhelming because he was experiencing this. He was in the presence of these angelic messengers. <clears throat> and it reminds me kind of of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6, where he saw the Lord high and lifted up a vision of the throne room of God. And he saw seraphim flying around, crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And remember Isaiah's response in Isaiah chapter 6? He said, woe is me. And the reason he said that is he said, I'm undone because I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell among the people of unclean lips. I think in the presence of the majestic angels, the purity, the holiness, the sin is just is just amplified, and I think that's what he sees. I think about Peter when he recognized who Jesus was with the great catch of fish in the boat. He said, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. When he recognized who Jesus is, he recognized all the more his own sin. And so uh, here Daniel is overwhelmed, and uh, being a corruptible being in the presence of, of purity, that might be one reason, but also, as I mentioned, the message itself of great conflict upon the people that he cared for so much. And so in verse 10, it says, Suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. And he said to me, that is the glorious man, this angelic messenger said to me, Oh, Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright. For I now have been sent to you. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. So Daniel's been flat on his face, but then he gets the touch from the heavenly. And I love the words there. Oh, man, greatly beloved. It's like, know that you are loved, Daniel. And so Daniel's able to get enough strength to stand up, but he's trembling there uh, before him. It says in verse 12, Then he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come because of your words. From the first day that you set your heart, remember back in verses two and three, it says in those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. And it seems to be a picture of him fasting and praying. And, and maybe again, praying for the situation in Jerusalem, praying for his people. And here the angel says to him, from the first day that you set your heart to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come, this angelic messenger, because of your words. I have come because you prayed. Does that stand out to you? I mean, the Bible tells us to pray, and sometimes we have the idea of, well, God knows everything. He knows what I need. You know, why should I pray? Because God tells us to pray, and I, what I'm suggesting here is what we see in this passage is prayer moves mountains, prayer moves angels. It affects the spiritual realm from the first day. Now, this is interesting because Daniel was mourning 
fasting and praying for three weeks, but it says, from the first day your words were heard, and were heard, and I was sent to you because of your words. And the question is, why did it take three weeks for the angel to get to Daniel? Is heaven that far away that it took him that long to get there? The answer is in the next verse. In verse 13, it says, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me, here it is, 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I'd been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Guys, we're talking about spiritual warfare tonight. I think this is a great chapter that gives us insight into what's taking place in the spiritual realm. There is a spiritual realm that runs parallel with the physical realm. In other words, it's right here among us. Things happening that we don't see, but they're still happening. Like I mentioned on Sunday, it, the invisible, it's like radio waves. Radio waves are in this room right now. Even though we don't see it, they're still here. If you had a radio receiver and you tune into that, you'll hear those radio waves. I think spiritually speaking, we can tune in and be more sensitive to God's spirit, more sensitive to the things that are happening. So in the spiritual realm, there are wars going on. There are struggles that are taking place. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, he says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. There's a war going on, there's a battle, but our fight is not in the physical realm. It's in the spiritual realm. And Paul goes on to talk about being clothed with the spiritual armor, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And then he says this at the, at the end of that kind of concluding the spiritual armor. He says in Ephesians 6, 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me. Again, here's the battle armor, but he concludes it by saying pray. Pray with all prayer. Pray in the spirit because our battle is fought and won not in the physical realm, but it's fought and it's won in the spiritual realm because that's where that's taking place. So as this angel, the glorious man, the messenger, is dispatched, he runs into resistance. The, the prince of the kingdom of Persia, the prince of the kingdom of Persia whom he runs into, and he's withheld for 21 days until Michael comes. Now, Michael is the only one in the Bible referred to as an archangel, okay? It's not to say there aren't other archangels, but he's the only one referred to as an archangel. It is interesting to note, though, in verse 13, how we just read Michael, one of, one of the chief princes. He doesn't say the only chief prince, but one of the chief princes. It's also interesting to see with Michael, who, by the way, whose name means who is like God, in verse 21 of chapter 10. It says, I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. No one upholds me against these except Michael. Notice this, your prince. Michael is your prince, Daniel. And then look at chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Michael shall stand up the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. Many commentators feel that Michael, the archangel, is specifically the guardian angel of the nation of Israel, that he is the protector of the nation of Israel. And it's interesting to see that, isn't it? He's one of the chief princes. The angel tells Daniel here that Michael is your prince, and then he also tells him that he stands watch over the sons of your people. Now, we read about Michael in the book of Jude, verse 9, where it says, yet Michael the archangel in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses dared not bring against him a reviling accusation but said the Lord rebuke you. Here we see Michael again. He's contending with the devil and the devil is a fallen angel. So again we've got this battle that's taking place in 
the spiritual realm. Also, it's over the body of Moses. And who is Moses? Moses is one of the chief people of, of the children of Israel. He's the one that God used to bring the covenant to the people of God. And so Michael battling in the spiritual realm and the focus, the children of Israel. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, it says, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail. Now, the dragon is the devil, clearly, clearly identified in Revelation chapter 12. And notice that Michael and his angels prevail because the dragon and his angels or his fallen angels, his demons. Some translations say they're just not strong enough, the NAS and the NIV. So Michael has the stronger angels and he's able, again, the battle is in the spiritual realm. He is able to prevail over the devil and his angels. So we see the conflict in the demonic realm. Now, how do we know we're in the angelic realm? Now, how do we know in verse 13 of Daniel 10 that the prince of the kingdom of Persia is an angel or a fallen angel and not a human being, not the son of the king? How do we know that he's actually a fallen angel? I think the answer to that is is this prince is withholding this angelic messenger that's trying to get to Daniel. And also, Michael, the chief prince, the archangel, is the one who comes and battles against this prince of Persia so that this glorious man can get to Daniel. David Guzik writes, since this prince, verse 13, the prince of the kingdom of Persia, this demonic spirit, since this prince was able to oppose the angelic messenger to Daniel, we know this was more than a man. This prince was some kind of angelic being, and we know he was an evil angelic being because he opposed the word of God coming to Daniel and stood against the angelic messenger. Now, I just want to go on a little aside for a moment because this really intrigued me with Michael being referred to as your prince, and he watches over the sons of your people, and it made me start thinking about guardian angels. And I just started looking at the passages in the Bible that speak of angels. And one of them that jumps out to me is Matthew chapter 18, where Jesus is speaking about the little children. And he said in Matthew 18, verse 10, Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. These little kids here, take heed. Be careful that you don't lead them astray because their angels are always beholding the face of the Father as the Father is watching out over you, ready to dispatch them at any moment to protect these little kids. Isn't that neat to think about that? Again, we have a real realm that we don't see, a parallel realm, the spiritual realm, and there are angels that we see. Michael, who's watching out over the children of Israel, these guardian angels, if you will, that are watching out over these little ones, as Jesus puts it. In Acts chapter 12, another interesting passage where, where Peter is arrested and he's thrown into jail. And then if you remember, an angel comes and opens up the, the doors and he, and he miraculously can, can leave. And, and he goes to the house of Mary where there's a prayer meeting going on for his release. And he goes, and you might remember the story, he goes to the door and he knocks on the door and a girl comes, who is it? Because they're inside, they're afraid because... James, the brother of John's already been put to death, and now Peter has been arrested, and the plan is that he's going to be put to death after the feast. So they've got the doors locked. It's like, who is it? It's Peter. And the girl gets so excited, she runs back to the prayer meeting. You know, it's like, our prayers have been answered. It, Peter's at the door, and the response was, you're out of your mind. It couldn't be Peter. He's in jail. You know, that's, those are prayers of faith there that they're praying. But Peter is set free, and, and this is the thing. They said to her, you are beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, it is his angel. And there was a belief. I think the belief continues that there are guardian angels that are assigned to the people of God. In Psalm 91, verse 11, it says, For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Giving angels the, the charge to protect you, the guardian, the protecting angels. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, 
Referring to angels, it says, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? The word minister is translated in other spots, servant. So referring to angels, for are they not all serving spirits sent forth to serve those who will inherit salvation? Now, who's going to inherit salvation? The believers, right? So these are, are serving angels that are sent to serve God's people, the believers. That's really it's something that we don't think on too much, but it's a reality that angels who are great in power and might are there for you and me. And, and man, I bet if we had a glimpse into the spiritual realm to see what was going on, I bet we'd be like Daniel. I, be, I bet we'd be flat on our face, just overwhelmed at the majesty of these beings and probably at what is happening. And I bet we would pray more when we see how Daniel's prayer, it's because of your words that I came. And that's what I hope resonates with us, just the importance of prayer as we see in scripture, that it moves the spiritual realm. And again, the battle is fought and the battle is won on our knees, not in the physical realm. And so again, he says in verse 13, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision refers to many days yet to come. So it's a message that concerns concerns Israel in the future. This is what's going to happen to your people in the latter days. Verse 15, when he had spoken such words to me, I turned my face toward the ground and became speechless. And suddenly one having the likeness of the sons of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke, saying to him who stood before me, my Lord, Because of the vision, my sorrows have overwhelmed me and I've retained no strength. For how can this servant of my Lord talk with you, my Lord? As for me, no strength remains in me now, nor is any breath left in me. Then again, the one having the likeness of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O man, greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be to you. Be strong. Yes, be strong. So when he spoke to me, I was strengthened. And said, let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. And so again, Daniel, he's overwhelmed, but the touch of the heavenly. Notice he touched my mouth. It's like, again, the, the seraph who took the coal off of the altar and touched Isaiah's lips. And now you're, you're cleansed. You're, you're purified from, from that iniquity. And so he strengthened him. And again, I, I, I love how it refers to Daniel as a man who is beloved, a man who's loved by God. And that's the reality of things, guys. God loves us. As we talked about on Sunday, God loves us so much. And we want to we wanna recognize that and, and believe it and know it to be fact because it is that he loves us so, so wonderfully. So peace, be strong, and Daniel is strengthened. Verse 20, then he said, do you know why I've come to you? And now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, indeed, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. Do you know why I came? I have come to tell you the scripture of truth. And what he's going to give to him, the message, is going to be the Medo-Persian Empire is going to be followed by the Greek Empire. And after the Greek Empire, there's going to be two kings, the king of the north and the king of the south. They're going to battle it out, and the king of the north is going to persecute your people. But your people are going to be strong. They're going to be able to stand up. And then it telescopes into the last days and the persecution of the Antichrist, where we read in chapter 12, verse 1, where there's going to be a time of unprecedented trouble upon the earth. But ultimately, Jesus is going to return, and there's going to be the kingdom age where he will reign supreme. He said, I've come to tell you the scripture of truth. Guys, we need to realize that half of what he told Daniel, half of what he's going to say in chapter 11 has already come to pass. 
Medo-Persia, Greece, Antiochus Epiphanes, that has all come to pass. And it has come to pass because it's the scripture of truth. It is what is going to happen. And just as those things came to pass, the other prophecies that he speaks in here are going to come to pass as well. There is going to be an Antichrist that comes. There is going to be great tribulation. There is going to be the second coming of Jesus, and he is going to set up his kingdom. Just as all of the other prophecies have come to pass, so these will come to pass as well. We need to realize that, and we need to believe it strongly in our heart because it's true. I wanted to point out in verse 20 where he said that I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, indeed, the prince of of Greece will come. Now, these princes, as we already talked in verse 13, a reference to fallen angels or, or demonic spirits. There seems to be territorial demons. Just like Michael is a good angel that is there to protect the children of Israel, there seems to be territorial demons, the prince of Persia, the prince of Greece, that are influencing the human leaders of those nations. Do you believe that demons influence people? Do you remember in the the Gospels how demons not only influenced people, but they possessed people, and Jesus cast out many demons? It says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. And so this is what the demons try to do. They try to deceive. And again, as we look at this passage, it seems that there are territorial demons that are seeking to influence the leaders of nations, not just back in Daniel's day, but I believe in our day as well. And that's why I think it's so important for us to pray for the leaders of our country. And the number one thing to pray is that they would become believers if they're not. You see, if they're a believer, then they've got, you know, they've got ones like Michael on their side, you know, and those guys are more powerful. But if they're not believers, I do believe there are territorial demons that seek to influence. And so, again, this angelic messenger came to Daniel because of his words. And we're instructed to pray for the leaders of our country. And so what do our prayers do? You kind of think, well, what's my prayer going to do? But when we look at this chapter, prayer does a lot. And so I hope it encourages us to realize that our words, when they go forth, when we're praying, it's doing something in the spiritual realm. And we want to see, do we not? We want to see God's hand upon our nation. I tell you, the risk of getting political, I love listening to Mike Pence at the vice presidential debate. I mean, that was so refreshing, you know, to to talk about his, when he committed his life to Christ and his heart for the the unborn and everything. I thought, oh, Lord, if we had somebody like that, you know, if God just worked it in a certain way where he became president, you know. But then when I thought about that, I thought, how many people are really going to follow behind that kind of a lead? I would hope they would. I'd hope it would be from the top down. We got a man who's humble, who's seeking the Lord, and it would affect and influence the nation. But would it do that? Or would the nation rebel? And here, if that was the case, this is what through my mind. Here, God, you know, in his mercy has given us a, a righteous and a godly leader, perhaps only for the nation to turn away even farther from God. And then it would be true, oh Lord, you are righteous when you judge. You have given us everything we need, and yet we have turned so far away from me. I hope that's not the case. It's just the thought that went through my mind. We need to pray. We need to pray for our leaders because the battle is fought and the battle, I believe, is won in the spiritual realm. In 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 4, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Though we live in this physical realm, the war is not here. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. He says, I must return to fight with the prince of Persia, and when I've gone forth, indeed, the prince of Greece will come, verse 21. But I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth, and then parenthetically, he says, no one upholds me against these except Michael, your prince. Chapter 11, also, 
In the first year of Darius the Mede, I and I stood up to confirm and strengthen him. End of parenthetical section, verse 2. And now I will tell you the truth. And the message begins in chapter 11. And that's what we're going to take a look at as we gather together again next week. So read ahead if you like. It's one of the most detailed prophecies concerning the Seleucids and the Ptolemies battling it out in the second and third century BC. Let's go ahead and pray and then we'll open it up for any comments or questions you have. Father, we do thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for just the insight I believe that we truly see here in Daniel chapter 10. A, a, a glimpse into the spiritual realm to see what takes place when a person of God prays, to see how the angels are dispatched and move. And I just pray, Lord, that we would, for no other reason, just be obedient to your direction and pray, and pray for our leaders and pray for our families, oh God, that it would inspire us to, to pray with more of a, an intensity and to be more intentional in our prayers. And I also thank you, Father, that you love us and that there are angels that are watching over us and creating a hedge of protection of oh god that that we are ever in your sight and you are all powerful and nothing could break through and harm us unless you allowed it to take place and lord we know beyond a shadow of a doubt you always have our best interests at heart and lord we rest in that father we lift up our nation oh god and we just pray for your mercy. We pray, O oh God, that no matter what happens in this election year, that you would use your people to be light in the world we live in, that we would pray and then we would get up and go forth and speak forth the truth of your word, O oh God. Open up those doors, Lord. Give us the boldness, I pray, to step through them and the heart to be able to reach these people that you have sent your son to die for. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Any questions? Any comments? What do you think? You can disagree if you want, but what do you think? I think it's interesting. Yes, Bob. Um, well, addressing your comments uh, concerning um, the influence of our leaders on the world of the country, uh, I think folks like Kenny Brown have to really Read. I have seen that happen over my lifetime. What's that? My first president I remember was Truman. I was pretty young then, but, but Truman and then, then Eisenhower and so on down the line. One day I sat down and kind of wrote out a little thing for myself, and I couldn't believe the influence of all of them. But the most, the most awesome experience for me was when I went to the Fox Theater in San Diego. I don't even know if it's still there anymore. But I go down there and watch a movie, and they say, ladies and gentlemen, will you please stand up and face the flag? They started playing the national anthem. Reagan was the president. That was the influence he caused over that little section right mm. there. You know, mm. it, it happens all the time. The other thing being, Pence may be, you know, now I'm not being political here. I'm just talking about circumstances. It's okay. I'm with you. I hear you. Pence may be an influence to be on somebody else. Mm. See? And, uh, and we don't know how God's working on it. 
you know, God worked all the way through this thing you're talking about, and yet, and yet he didn't put up a sign and say, well, why don't you make a right turn here and a left turn here or what have you? He had it all set up for him. He just made it work, and, and we can have the same thing, especially if we got on our knees and, and really started praying. Yeah, yeah, good, good word, good word. Good. <laughs> yeah yeah well guys we're back to once a week praise the lord so we'll see you next week read ahead in chapter 11 and that's what we'll be taking a look at next week thank you for coming out you guys have a great rest of the week all right thank you <laughs>